Welcome to the Noya Caribbean podcast. This podcast is dedicated to bringing to life Caribbean history and culture from our Indo-Caribbean experience, the lives of our indigenous people, the Arawak, Kalinago, Taino, and more, our African heritage, and of course, our gangster stories of resistance and rebellion in the Caribbean, throwing in the history of our music, food, and cultural practices. The more we know our history, the more we know ourselves. So get to know yourself through Know Your Caribbean, the Know Your Caribbean podcast. Welcome, folks, to this Know Your Caribbean mini episode. And we're going to talk about, very briefly, one of my favorite topics, mermaids. Yeah, we're going to talk about mermaids. And we know that Disney is launching the first black mermaid and there's been so much uproar about it in terms of people thinking that mermaids are a European thing. And I'm here to give you guys a bit of insight in looking at our own spirituality in the Caribbean, coming across from Africa and mermaids. And I came across this great essay by Paula T. Connolly and it's called Mermaids in the Middle Passage and it's looking at the relationship of mermaids in the Carolinas. Now, when we look at the Carolinas, that's like our cousins, okay? If you're from the Caribbean, the Carolinas are our cousins. Same way, look, we look at New Orleans like, yeah, you're a family. The Carolinas is family too, okay? So within parts of South and North Carolina, we have the Gullah Geechee culture, okay? Within the Gullah Geechee culture, there are two similarities. They have something called the Buhag, which is very reminiscent of what we know as the Sukuya or the Old Hag or the Old Hig, but that's one of the folklore characters that they have that's very, very similar to us. And I'll talk about that in another episode of our folklore. But they also have something called the Simbi, which is a mermaid. Now, this comes from the central region of Africa and from the Congo Empire. Before we get into that, I'm going to read a little bit of Polity Colony's essay. And she says, hey, as Africans were kidnapped enslaved and brought across the oceans to the americas many brought with them beliefs in powerful nature spirits that animated their world the south carolina low country became a locus of simbi faith because many of those forcibly transported and relocated there have been from west central africa the center of the simbi faith goes on to say that as nature spirits, Simbi inhabited the landscape, particularly as water spirits in rivers and streams. The Simbi's powers were vast and encompassing, offering a range of protections from health to prosperity to those who offered respect or who were in need and sheltered or favored by the Simbi. In Africa, Simbi came to be inflected with consciousness of enslavement. As the nature spirit was translocated to the Americas, the Simbi, or mermaid, who appears in tales told in the eastern United States, further reflected the enormity of enslavement. So looking at the Simbi in particular and its origins um, to the African Congo region, looking in the case of St. John's Berkeley University research, it says that the spirits were widely believed to inhabit the limestone sinkholes that were prolific in the area of the Congo. And that also that the Carolinas had many sinkholes filled with water that formed like lots of lakes and ponds. Back to Paula Connolly's essay, she goes on to say this, which I thought was very, very interesting when we're looking at our folklore as a whole, okay? Okay. So she says this, in the context of slavery, the Atlantic Ocean was the site of forced removal of millions of Africans to enslavement in the Americas, the Middle Passage being the first and essential catastrophe, provoking loss of space, culture, language, the uprooting from familiar faces and lands, a shifting cemetery of estimated millions of Africans. Yet as much as the vastness and depth of the Atlantic graveyard has made mass murder and attempted genocide seemingly invisible, the black mer figure both signifies on that assault and defies it. Now that, I thought, was a wicked insight. Within a lot of the folklore, uh, when you talk about Mami Wata, you talk about Watra Mama, Mama Glow, 
La Sirene in Haiti. When you look at the different variations, you talk about that she is this spirit that came across the Atlantic from Africa and now she's this protector, but you don't don't mess with her, this kind of thing like that. So I love that she both signifies the trauma and the brutalities of the middle passage, but she also defies it because she's a survivor and she's still here. And I love that concept of how we can look at, you know, the mermaid or mommy water or mama glow or, or river mama. There's so many different versions, but we have her there. She has survived that. She has survived not just the transatlantic slave trade, but she has survived all the years of the attempts to remove our consciousness of, of our spiritual beliefs or, or our African folklore law if you want to look at it in that way one of the things is that the simbi has been documented since the 1800s in the carolinas by this slave owner who was on some different estates in the carolinas and he does have some descriptions of his enslaved experiences with the simbi so Robert Wilson was a man in the Carolinas, in Charleston, North Carolina. And, you know, he lived um, up until 1924, which is quite recent history. But slavery in the USA lasted until 1865. He was a grown man during the era of slavery. So his documentation, you know, goes as this. A slave driver that accompanied a collie called Ruffin told him that he had never seen the Simbi. Others had told him that it was web-footed like a goose. Another elderly slave stated that a very young boy had seen another at a fountain. It was seated on a plank which was laid across the water and had a long brown hair of her head hung down so low it covered her face and her body and her limbs that he saw no other feature nor could he answer to my question whether she was a white or negro simbi except that she may be inferred from her long hair. After seeing her, she glided into the water and disappeared. Then he goes on to describe that there are Negro women at their laundry work, knee deep in the stream, beating clothes with heavy clubs. They are merry enough when together, but none of them will go alone for a pig in of water. And if you slip in the shadow of the old oak or throw a stone into the spring, the entire party will rush away at a splash and scream with fear, convinced the Simbi is after them. In another documentation, in Henry Ravenel's Recollections of the Southern Plantation Life, he says, There was a general belief in the guardian spirits of the water called Simbi among the slaves, he said. I have never been able to trace the word to any European language and conclude it must be African. If anyone disturbs the spring, the Simbi would be angry. If it was destroyed or much injured from any cause, the Simbi would leave it and the waters would dry up. The Simbis were proportionate in size to the spring. He concluded to say that they all have an entire faith in Simbi. And one of the old men with me with a gray face had said he had seen it. On inquiry about its appearance, he described the old traditional mermaid, a female form, half fish, sitting on the banks and combing out its long tresses. I personally think that if we're going to be talking about mermaids, this definitely deserves a full on proper episode. Because, I mean, just speaking about within Haitian voodoo, and that it is a spirit in itself, la sirene, and, you know, all the things about the offering. So when we're looking at voodoo and finding out a little bit more about it, when I did some of my research and looking at the offerings that they gave to la sirene, you'd never give in the offerings to her like fish or them kind of things. She likes certain things. She likes champagne. She likes sweet cakes. She likes cigarettes. And then you make these offerings to her. You go out to the sea and you make these lovely offerings to her. And I think these things are beautiful because we have such misconceptions about religions like voodoo. And I think putting together a beautiful piece of cake and like some champagne and going out into the ocean and saying thank you to her for all the things that she's done. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. I would really, really love to know more about it. And I think in a subsequent full-on episode we can dive into more and more about mermaids so just to close off this very 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 mini episode i'm just going to read some examples of famous people we know about and where they have said they have seen mermaids and these are some european men and here's what our most hated colonizer said that's christopher columbus in the ocean near haiti in 1493 he said this they're not as pretty as they are depicted for somehow in the face they look like men <laughs> 
So people will speculate that he saw manatees, but you know, a lot of Haitians will say, hell no, that's not what he saw. Because within Haitian culture, the mermaid is something that is hugely massive in Haiti and is beautifully documented as well. So John Smith, the guy who kidnapped Pocahontas, people should know they were, they were, yeah, they say they were married or whatever, but to me, Pocahontas was a child. So he kidnapped her. So he said this, he claimed in 1614 that he saw a fish-tailed mermaid with round eyes, a finely shaped nose, well-formed ears, and long green hair. The creature, he said, was by no means unattractive. There you go. So that's John Smith. Pocahontas says John Smith says he saw a mermaid. And the guy who the Hudson River in New York is named after. So Henry Hudson, the English explorer in 1608, also wrote this. This morning, one of our company looking overboard saw a mermaid. From the navel upwards, her back and breast were like a woman's. Her body was as big as one of us, her skin very white, her long hair hanging down behind, the color black. In her going back, they saw her tail, which was like the tail of a porpoise and speckled like a mackerel. So there we go. I think this description is quite detailed um, and it's not like Columbus's own, but it's like, it, to me, them fellows were like really nonchalant about it. Like, I think now if we were to describe mermaids, we're like, yo, we'd go into so much description. You know, there are also, you know, different versions of mermaids you can find in different cultures. For example, the Aborigines in Australia, they have their own version of mermaids called a yok yok. So it's Y-A-W-K, the yok yok. Um, the Inuits also have a story about the mermaids and her name is called Sedna. But this one, this story is a much, much darker, which I'll get into into another episode. But just to close off is that looking at our relationship, relationship with mermaids and no mermaids are not quintessentially european they're very much part of our own culture and in dutch guyana in the 1740s one colonist wrote this it sometimes happened that one or the other of the black slaves either imagines truthfully or out of rascality I've never heard that word before, rascality. I think that's, I'm going to start using that word. So out of rascality, pretends to have seen or heard an apparition or ghost, which they call water mama, which would have ordered them not to work on such and such a day, but to spend it as a holiday for offering with the blood of a white hen to sprinkle this and that at the water side and more of that monkey business, adding to such cases that if they do not obey this order shortly, what a mama would take the child or husband, die or harm them otherwise. We can see the misconceptions interlaced into this one paragraph. And I think it's really interesting for us to look deeper into the beauty of the legacy of the mermaid. And why do many of us see her as this nefarious creature? And there's actually so much beauty interlaced into it. And that she's someone that you pay homage to. She's a spirit that came across from Africa to be here as one of our protectors. But we are now interlaced with so much fear about the legacy of this beautiful mermaid. But we see the European mermaid as this wonderful, ethereal, beautiful creature. And I think it's really time for us to start look at the intricacies, the dynamics and the beauty behind our own black mermaids. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this little mini, mini, mini episode. And big up to our Patreon supporters. And I'll see you guys on the other side. Welcome to the Relatable Podcast, a safe space for open and honest conversations created for Black people. This podcast explores how we relate to one another in our intimate connections, friendships, family, and everything in between. Hosted by three Caribbean women. I am Fiona, a single mom. I'm Shaween, a very near empty nester. And I'm Chantal, a free-spirited monogamist. New episodes drop every Wednesday from June 9th, and you can find us wherever you get your podcast fix. Relatable, because a shared journey brings hope. <laughs>